Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire with this year's Nobel Prize winner in economics and professor of economics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in America, Abhijit Banerjee. Professor Banerjee, congratulations on Thank winning you. the Nobel you, with your you. wife Esther Duflo and Michael Kremer. Thank Tell me, was it a complete surprise or is Amartya Sen right when he reveals that your friends were hoping you'd get it last year? No, it was a complete surprise. I, I, I sort of associated with even more gray hair than I have. So you thought you wouldn't get it for several more years? Oh, I, I never thought I was a shoe in. I, I, I'm saying I absolutely didn't think, even think about it. It was not in the realm of possibilities I was considering. Tell me, how did you hear the news? Because I imagine that at the time they announced it in Stockholm, you were fast asleep in America. No, they call you. They, they call, call you. you before, one hour before they announce it, they call you, they wake you up, and they, they tell you in this kind of slightly scary voice, there's an important call from Stockholm. And then you, I guess you heard enough other people's narratives that you know now what's coming. So your heart leapt into your mouth. Yes, exactly. At that point, your heart is kind of trying to get out of you. And do you remember what you said after you heard the news? I said, thank you. <laughs> what does one say? <laughs> and I gather your wife says that you then went back to bed. Yeah, they said, well, it was, it's a, I, I, I heard that being slightly unfairly portrayed. But I, I feel that they told her that she needs to be the spokesperson for the three of us because they wanted a woman spokesperson. And therefore, I had nothing to do in the press conference that was coming up in an hour. Given that I had nothing to do, I figured I should catch up on my sleep. <laughs> Which is a very practical suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> now, this interview was originally fixed to discuss your book, and here it is. And I promise you, I will come to it in a moment's time. But first, since you're Indian, you're in India, I want to talk to you about the Indian economy. A few days ago at Brown University, you said, that the Indian economy was in crisis, and one of your solutions was pray, and another one was pray more. Would you expand on that for me? Oh, I just think it's, it, we have very, very, very little control over what economies do. I think the, the, the idea that we have a bunch of levers and if you just pull the right lever, we'll get out of a, of a, a tailspin, I think is largely overrated. I think there are things we should do but we shouldn't assume that they're going to work. I think there's a lot of things that are in the minds of people, people's expectations, people, people th worried about certain things. Whatever's going on which is leading to this cutback in consumption, the biscuit companies that famously closing, that's, this is a demand, sh seems to be a demand shortage in the economy. This is a wonderful admission from a Nobel Prize winning economist that actually we economists cannot be certain of what to do when there's a problem. We try and we attempt and hope it works, which is why you said pray and pray more. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. I, I think that, I think one of, the prob one of the points we make in uh, this book that you brought up is that one reason why people don't trust economists is, uh, is that our stance is oracular. We pronounce, r cut interest rates, this, that, and the other. And part of the problem is that we actually don't know, we have fairly little reason to be confident that these are going to work. And yet we say it with such confidence, and then of course half the time they don't work and people think we're idiots. Uh, so I think we would be much better off explaining how much we know, what's it based on, how much confidence we have. This is what we try to do in this book, is to try to say why we should be kind of, what's the logic behind certain statements and therefore maybe why we should believe it or believe it less or more. Let's go one step back. How serious is the problem facing the Indian economy? You called it a crisis at Brown University. Is that how you see it? Look, I'll tell you one fact. It, it needs a, it could be that there is some, people will find that the fact is, you know, maybe less strong than it is. I, I haven't actually, it's a fact that somebody wrote about, but he, I think he's competent. Himangshu at JNU wrote this piece, which he, he just analyzes the mean consumption in, for the whole country in the NSS 2014-15 and the NSS 2017-18. And for the first time in my memory, it's lower in 2018 than in 2014-15. This is average consumption for the whole country. 
So this number has gone down over the, slightly, just 50 rupees or something, but still it's, it's, a, it's not, it's unprecedented. It's in fact, rural consumption today is the lowest it's been in the last seven years. Yes. And at Brown, talking about Himanshu's findings, your words were, this hasn't happened in many, 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 many years. I counted that, five many's. Yes. Which is why you're perturbed. Yes, that, that has to be a frightening fact. I mean, whether or not, you know, I'm, I'm happy to let people dig into these numbers and decide that, you know, in fact, he did, did the deflator wrong or some macroeconomic thing wasn't quite done right. I, I, I'm not vouching for this number. I didn't compute them myself. But he's a very competent guy. He came up with these numbers. The prima facie, they look very worrying. In fact, at Brown, you said, and I'm quoting you, investment has totally collapsed by a factor of 75%. Exports are not growing, whilst average consumption is steadily going down. That, to me, suggests that three out of four engines of growth have ceased to fire, and India, at the moment, is limping on just one. I, I think that's right. I think the government is the only sector that is still, uh, you know, spending money. And I think that's a, that I, I, look, I already admitted that I don't, I'm not one of these people who believes that we, economic models are extremely precise predictors. Lots of things depend on expectations, on what people believe. Hope has its own dynamic. But I still think that if you had to go by what data is available, this data doesn't look reassuring. To what extent is demonetization and to what extent is GST the cause of the problem? I have no idea. These are all too, too, too much in the weeds. There's so many, I mean, the effects are so complicated uh, that I think anybody who says it's 30% GST and 40% um, demonetization is making up. But would you say that these two, demonetization and GST, have a role, a critical role to play? I don't know. It's critical. Other things also happen. I think the key other one that's very important is the, the, defla the deflationary pressure put in by the fact that the agriculture support prices were held down. This is why our inflation rates are down. And that so we've deliberately suppressed agriculture prices to earning, keep yeah. urban inflation down. And as a result, we've created rural distress and problems for 60% of the population. Yeah, so a, de a demand problem as a result. You know, these people spend money. They're, they're not... They're not huge savers, they, they spend money when they earn it. And those people are not earning money. If you look at the, what's called the terms of trade, the relative price of agriculture versus non-agriculture has been going against agriculture for the last. So would you say that in fact the deliberate holding down of MSPs and agriculture prices to keep urban inflation down is one of the principal problems that's created this economic situation today? Again, I, I'm going to be a little more less prescriptive than that because, I, I, as I said, I don't believe that we tea, read the tea leaves well enough. But if I had to pick, I think people have emphasized demonetization. They've emphasized uh, GST. GST. I also think the, this is a key factor. Now, something else you said at Brown struck me as very interesting and important. You said institutions have turned into zombies. They are completely frozen, whilst the PMO, which controls all of them, is so busy, nothing happens. Were you suggesting that, in fact, proper effective governance has more or less broken down in India? So I think it's over-centralized. This is the point that uh, Raghuram Rajan made. I think I agree with him that essentially, as I see it, uh, my businessmen friend all say the same thing, which is over centralized. That, that that they they be, they go they when they go in with a good proposal, the the relevant secretaries are, are a little bit cherry of taking decisions. They they want to check that the decision is consistent with some vision, but the vision is not in their office. So I, I, I've heard this from many people, and it's very consistent with what Raghu said about uh, over centralized So the bureaucracy is slowing things down, and you suspect that what slows the bureaucracy down is the central authority and control of the PMO, which doesn't move fast enough. Well, I think it's just impossible for it to. I mean, I think it's not that it's, it's just, I think at a national scale, just there's so many decisions to take. If you have to take, try to take good decisions, 
it's going to be very hard. Decentralization has to be there because no one authority or office can centralize and run a country this size. Yes, even if with the best of will and the best of skills, you can't do it. I really think that decentralization is important. You have to trust people. They'll make mistakes. Stuff will happen. But I think that's, that's the way an economy runs, is by having people taking decisions based on their best judgment, and sometimes based on other things as well. I mean, there'll be, there will be stuff that you don't, wouldn't like. Decentralization has a cost, which is that you know, there are the scope for malfeasance. But I, I just think that's the only way you get an economy running. Now, I know although you live and work in Massachusetts, you've actually kept a close association with India and you've obviously followed the manner in which this economy has been functioning. Would I be right in saying that from your comments at Brown, you believe that the first Modi government from 214 to 219 has mishandled the economy? Would I be right in saying that? It, it, st it reacted to the previous, the UPA government's misfortunes by saying, look, you know, we we, we, what we have is a, here a bunch of institutions kind of going their own way. Sometimes hauling up government ministers and putting them in jail because you know they, they are this sort of uh, these, there's lots of independence. And now as a result, the whole thing looks chaotic. It created its own. I mean, it was clear. Per, per so sense. Modi reacted to what you thought was. Uh, a sense of anarchy under the UPA and over-centralized. I think that was, that's one possible interpretation. What about steps like demonetization? Was that an error? I think it was an error, but I, you know, I, I, I think that whether it was the source of a catastrophe or not... That we don't know. That we don't know. But in itself, it was an error. I don't think it served the purpose it was meant to serve. I do think that eventually people with black money found their way. I mean, that's what the Reserve Bank numbers show. They found their way to get around things. People are very inventive. What about the character of GST as implemented? There I'm less like, other than, I'm, my inclination is to say that would have been, any government trying to implement GST would have fought the same forces and come to the same compromise. I think it's very difficult to do because in the end, there's enormous com complicated structure of subsidies and cross subsidies built into the sales tax and other 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 uh, sort of local tax systems and those that's a, and everybody is you know as soon as anybody is going to lose something they're going to start yelling and you know the government tried i think uh, i think it started from a pretty good frame and it got as the compromise rolled out it, it made a bunch of choices, and then those choices were not necessarily the greatest, and the, maybe the bureaucratic machinery wasn't ready. But I, I would take a bet that if another government implemented it, they would have felt very much the same political. So whoever implemented GST would have probably made the same sort of mistakes and errors. It's not that this government has made unique mistakes that could have been avoided. That's a stronger statement than, I mean, I, I don't know what exactly constitute which mistakes and what are political compromises, but it, I can say that the there would have been complaints, screams about all the, all the things in which we didn't follow the original template. Tell me, if you were to advise the finance minister today and he were to ask, Abhijit Banerjee, how should I respond, beg your pardon, she, how should I respond to the crisis the economy faces, what would your advice be? I would say loosen monetary policy and go with a demand stimulus. Right now, I think we need a demand stimulus in the short run. I think this is... This is would you <coughs> specify what sort of demand stimulus? Is this an income tax cut, a GST no, cut? No, a demand stimulus meaning put money in the hands of poor people. I think that they spend, they will spend the money. That's sort of what we saw from the NRDG expansion was that there was, that there was a boom. In the middle of the global financial crisis, we got a boom partly because NRDG expanded and that, that generated earnings at the, at the ground level and that, that filtered into demand. The closest thing this government has to what you're talking about is PM Kasan, whereby they give 2,000 rupees three times a year or whatever, four times a year to farmers. Reports by Pranab Sen, the former chief statistician, and in a sense confirmed by Bibek Debroy to me <laughs> literally just 10 days ago, is that 
<coughs> a lot of the money allocated for PM Kisan hasn't actually been passed through. The government seems to be sitting on it. Some people say, in fact, the government is sitting not just on PM Kisan money, but also money for suppliers and money for projects that hasn't been paid. And Ajit Ranade says the total could be as much as 10 lakh crore. This is clearly money you believe that must be pushed through. I think that's right. I think the government needs to take urgent action to get money out of the door. I think it's, this is, this is so sort of related to the worry about centralization, that maybe decisions are slow. So your answer to the finance minister's question would be, do everything you can to create demand. Right now, yes. I think then, once the economy takes off, you can think of more long-term issues to deal with how to get investment up, etc. But I think the first order thing, I think investment is, my worry is that a tax cut will just, people will sit on it till demand is there. People don't like investing till they have a assured demand. One more but separate question. Recently, Rahul Gandhi tweeted that you were one of the international economists who had helped give advice to Congress when they were devising their NYAI scheme. And separately, Praveen Chakrabarti has written, that your association giving advice perhaps lasted for several months. Can you tell me, what was the nature of your role and involvement with NIAI? They wanted numbers, I provided numbers. If you do this, how much would it cost? Who, who, if you wanted to get everybody up to this level of income, how much money would you have to give them? That's sort of what I do as a professional. And uh, they asked me questions that I was, I think, reasonably well placed to answer. Actually, I wasn't that well placed to answer. I asked my friend uh, Thomas Piketty, who is really sits on these numbers, but he is he, he, he's the one who pulled, pulled his world uh, economic lab, basically, world inequality lab, pulled these numbers off. And then I, we discussed, we, we discussed these numbers with, with Praveen. Um, I don't think I was I, do, I certainly had no say on exactly what scheme they would come up with. In the end, Congress announced a scheme whereby every family that is part of the poorest 20% of the population would receive 6,000 rupees a month, a total of 72,000 rupees a year. And it was calculated that this would perhaps cost 3.6 lakh crore. You believe that's affordable? Depends on what else you did with it. I mean, I, I think that it would, I think to be... Uh, really sustainably affordable, it would need to substitute for many other subsidies. But I think it is a, I think we need to move in that direction of taking away kind of specific subsidies of a large, uh, of, and replace them by lump sum subsidies. And that's all, that's an idea that both sides have accepted. In a sense, the PM Kisan is just a much, much less expensive version of that. But it's exactly saying, instead of giving farmers support prices, we'll give them cash. The logic is the same. The logic is the same, and I'm, I'm all for that logic. If, they, if you want to actually go, f I think it's much harder to implement that than the, the support prices, because then you have to identify who to give it to and not give it to. Are they big this enough? This is a not? direct benefit transfer universally to everyone. Universally is, would be easy to do. What is harder to do, and this is part of the challenge that the Congress were facing. Identifying I that 20%. I told them is that how do you identify the 20%? This is, this is the conversation we had. As I was telling them, this is what you're going to worry about. Uh, if it's I, one of the criticisms do. made was that the income of someone on the 19th or 20th percentile who gets that 6,000 a month will take him or her right up to the 58th percentile and all the percentiles in between will have been ignored and will feel upset because they're left out. And Sur Surjit Bhalla calculated that you're possibly talking of about as many as 400 million people who are left out. That sort of anguish, I suppose, is inevitable and was inherent in that scheme. Well, it's, it's exactly the question of whether you you target an income or you target a, target a subsidy. So if you target an income and say everybody's going to be brought to this income, then of course this, you know, nobody will cross. If you target an amount, then of course some people are going to cross. And I had also pointed that out. So I, I think these, these issues are very real. And I, it's not that I feel that they came up with the scheme that I loved. And I told them that. So it was, it was not a scheme that... 
It's interesting a moment ago that you compared the logic of PM Kasan with the logic of Nyai, because I want to quote to you something that yesterday at a public press conference, the Minister for Commerce and Industry, Piyush Goyal said about your association with Nyai. And these are his precise words. His thinking is totally left-leaning. He had praised the Nyai scheme effusively, but the people of India totally rejected his thinking. Have you been rejected by the people of India? I, you know, I, I wish the people of India took me that seriously. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think I think the people of India voted for Mr. Modi. Uh, I think they decided that they don't really have enough faith in any policy pronouncement to really buy it because policy pronouncements was not wh what I think this government campaigned on. It com campaigned on Mr. Modi, his clean image, his our national security, nationalism and terror. Yeah. So th this 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 is this is what they voted for, and I don't think they particularly went through you know Abhijit Banerjee's proposal. Oh, I hate it. Th th I wish I, I would be flattered to think that, but I, I'm not that vain. Now, in fact, it seems to me that the BJP isn't even fond of you. They're certainly not proud of the fact that you've got the Nobel because again yesterday, Rahul Sinha who's the national secretary of the party, said this of your winning the Nobel. I'm quoting him. Those who have foreigners as their second wife are only getting the Nobel. I do not know if that is a condition to get a Nobel or not. Do you want to respond to that or would it be below your dignity to do so? Does it upset you, though, to read this? Because you come back to your own country, yeah. and this it, is how... It upsets me a little bit, because I, I, I do feel that I, I... I would like to be seen primarily as a professional. I am closer to being uh, in, in my practice, whatever my private views are, to be a, a surgeon, and I will, whoever's on the operating table, I will operate the same way. I do believe in that professionalism is very important. And it is hurtful to come back to your country and hear this sort of yeah, this is, this vicious, is, cheap comment. Yeah, this is not useful because it's sort of, it starts by being partisan, whereas my in, in, instincts are, and in a sense our work in JPL is completely in, inclined to be non-partisan. We work with Mr. Modi in Gujarat. We work with, uh, we're currently working with Mr. Khattar in Haryana. We're working with, uh, you know, the AIA, DMK in, in uh, Tamil Nadu. We, we, we certainly have no particular, we're working with the U UP government. It's not that we have any particular uh, sort of policy of working only with Congress or only with I mean, we work, also work with Mamata Manaji in West Bengal. We also work with uh, Amrinder Singh in Punjab. We work with anybody who wants, who's, wants to take a policy see question seriously and work on it. And we work in Gujarat. We got extremely good support from the, we work with the Pollution Control Board there. And they were very supportive. They took our results seriously. They implemented it. It was, it was, it was a very rewarding experience. And I, I, I don't, I see that as being the, Primary uh, primary bias of, of us is that we want to support good policy. Let's then move away from politics and let's come to your book and here it is. It's called Good Economics for Hard Times. I've read several sections of your book. And what struck me is there are many points you make that have direct relevance to India and I'd like to take up some of them with you. You say, let's be clear, tax cuts for the wealthy do not produce economic growth. There is no evidence that massive tax cuts for the rich promote economic growth. To begin with, doesn't that run contrary to the widespread belief that the Reagan tax cuts of the 80s and Chidambaram's dream budget tax cuts of 98 actually did fairly substantially stimulate growth? I think it, that's the disadvantage of taking your episode, choosing your episodes and... and uh, you know, then you, you can certainly find some episodes where a tax was cut and the growth went up. In fact, Reagan, to be honest, is not clear. Even if you look at the U.S. growth, U.S. growth really remains completely on trend. If you detrend it, I mean, there's some short run, Reagan creates a massive uh, re recession. 
when he first comes in, the Reagan recession, 81, 82. Then starting at the low base, the economy starts growing. Now, if you aggregate over all of those things, actually the Reagan tax cuts don't do very much. Even what about the Chidambaram tax cut of 98? The dream budget is the There was it. lots of other things that happened, including a lot of debt that was accumulated, which was then later regretted. Uh, I mean, I think one of the th mechanisms of, of our growth has been cheap credit, which is... So has, neither of the examples I've quoted actually disprove your point. Uh, but also, even if those examples existed, so let's say there were two examples of tax cuts which increase, which which were accompanied by increased growth. The I'll find you the two others where the tax cut had no effect on In other words, you can find examples to I argue either way. Yes. So therefore, I don't believe any of it. Let me put this to you. Maybe there's no direct correlation between tax cuts and economic growth, but don't tax cuts have a big impact on sentiment and animal spirits? And doesn't that in turn boost investment and growth? Again, I think that if it did, we would find it in the data. I mean, you just people, when they look at it carefully, look at what they've, what, what's ni nice now is that people have looked at this quite carefully. And the way, way they do it is they look at US states competing on taxes. So some states give you massive tax breaks, others don't. Does that increase growth in those states? They find no evidence that those tax cuts have any. This is very interesting. People have this impression that tax cuts fuel and spur investment and growth. But you're saying when you look at the evidence, in fact, it's missing. So it's just an impression. The facts don't support it. Yeah, I'm saying that. Well, this is very interesting because I deliberately began this way because, as you know, in September, the finance minister announced a dramatic cut in corporate tax to 22% and a new rate of just 15% of companies incorporated in October. Are you suggesting that this will not lead either directly or even perhaps substantively to fresh investment and growth? Look, again, I go back to my general warning that we you know, we can only read the tea leaves as much as we, you know, the data permits. The the sort of the let off for the for the new businesses is a bit different that's that's a, sometimes countries claim that I, I i'm not saying that a short term let off for new businesses may not may or may not be a good idea that's a i think slightly distinct question what but, about but other for, existing the, for, businesses? for the for the existing businesses i feel like in a demand slump they're not going to invest they're going to wait till demand recovers and at the moment, demand is showing no sign of recovery. And there are already newspaper reports like the Indian Express, which suggests that India's top 500 are sitting on cash reserves of over 8 lakh crore. So lack of money is not deterring them. Giving them more won't encourage. Yeah, that's, that's sort of my instinct on that. You have, in fact, a wider, more interesting point to make about growth. You're right. We have no accepted recipe to make growth happen in poor countries. And you suggest that simply emulating the Asian tigers or China is no guarantee for success. So then, if the finance minister were to say to you, Abhijit Banerjee, what do I do to revive India's flagging growth? Is it just more demand, more demand, more demand? No. I think I, the more demand will only work for a little while. I have never heard of a, of a permanent growth stimulus generated by more demand. I think so, more demand generates perhaps investment, but I think the climate the climate for investment, the true investment climate, which is the, you know, the speed of decision making in government, those things do matter. So I, I, don't, I, I think that while there is no recipe for getting permanent high growth, there are certainly things you can do to completely break the machine. Give me an idea what those things might be. I mean, think of India before 1985. I mean, you, you start to, India starts to liberalize actually early, 80, mid 80s under Rajiv Gandhi, you start to see some liberalization. But before that, the decision making was extraordinarily centralized. There was, there was private sector, but it was always like, you know, you had to guess what the government was going to decide, what price is going to set, whether the foreign exchange on this particular import will be allowed. We're going down that route. We have complex and growing tariffs on many things. So, you know, we, we are sort of going down that route of being pretty controlling. And that's a, that wasn't what was worked for us. So I, I think that it, there is a, we can certainly, if you want to break growth, 
there are ways to do it. You can just be extraordinarily controlling and then the private sector will give up. Which is why you're against the centralization that's happening under the Modi government. And it seems to me that you're stressing the need for decentralization, for quicker decisions, and for more decisions and transparent ones. And maybe the chance to make mistakes. I, I do think that one thing that shouldn't be, you know, it shouldn't be that, you know, you, if you are seen to have made a mistake, you should be, you are, you know, you can be investigated. I think, I think we have to let people, people make mistakes. I think it's, the, in, in bureaucracy, it's extremely important that people are empowered to say, I'll take that decision. It's, it's, a, it's a call. That call may not work. But if, you know, we need to make calls from time to time. What about factor reforms like land and labor? Yeah. So, and likewise, I think the, this government started with a bunch of, I think, useful talk about both land and labor. And I think in labor in particular, uh, you know, there was this nice example of Rajasthan, which had kind of taken a bunch of steps. And I think that was so, so some idea that that will be pushed out to the rest Rajasthan of the country. Rajasthan raised the IDA limit from 100 to 300. Many people say that's not sufficient. In fact, there's a bit of your book that I want to quote at this moment. You say in your book that India's labor protection laws, and I think you talk about the IDA in particular, exacerbate unemployment. Yeah. And that, I think, is a point that many politicians agree with, some even in this government. But they all seem to lack the resolve to bite this bullet. How would you encourage them to do so? Well, I think that, um, I think as uh, uh, Raghuram Rajan says in his Brown Lecture, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. You know, if you have, a, if you have a, this moment where I think some things need to get moving, I think the government should use it as a way to, I think it's easy, when the economy is growing, it's very hard to inflict, take on hard political decisions. I think this is a good time to take on a few hard political decisions. Because this is a small elite that's benefiting from uh, 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 these uh, restrictions. It's a, it's a so you're saying, if I am correct, and I'm only spelling it out, so correct me if I'm spelling it out wrongly, this is a moment to actually take those labor reforms that make hire and fire easier. And this is a moment to also undertake land acquisition reforms, which the Modi government attempted but then gave up in 2014. Because in a crisis, you can do it. If you don't use this crisis, you lose the opportunity. Right. To. I, think it, I think the Prime Minister has lots of um, credibility among many of the voters. If he goes to them and says, look, for the nation, this needs to happen now, I think they will actually be both respectful and sympathetic. The question is, does he have the will to do it? Yeah, I, I, I don't. He has the strength. He has the strength. Will I? I don't exactly know what is stopping him, but I think it would be good if we had more of a broader recognition of the fact that we might be in a crisis, and I think partly the muddying of the waters on data doesn't help because you know uh, you have people announcing that we are still growing at 6% or whatever. I mean, you know, you have, if you read the social media, it's not clear that you learn what the state of the economy is. In fact, the, what you call the mudding of the waters on data is particularly paradoxical when the Modi government's first chief economic advisor has gone on record, Arvind Subramaniam, to say that, in fact, GDP growth for the period roughly 210, 211 to 217, 18 was actually something like 2.5% less than what the data suggests. Yeah. And even that's been ignored by the government. In fact, the government has officially, through their Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council, rubbished him. Yeah. So, I, I, again, you can always argue that what Arvind does, which is to triangulate a bunch of facts that, uh, other facts than the growth rate, is, you know, it, there, is, there are possibilities of error. But if you don't take the set of warning signs all together and say that, look, Let's at least recognize that they would, there is some possibility that we are in a deep hole. I think that's a mistake. And I think the and government... Modi is making that mistake. I don't know that he's making it or whether this is just a slow downpedaling of expectations. I, this I can't tell because they have all actually downpedaled expectations. They have said 5% is a good growth rate. This is the, the, what, what... Except the, that Rajiv Kumar, <coughs> the vice chairman of Niti Aayog, 
when the 5% rate first came out, publicly said to the Hindustan Times that growth in the second half of the year would exceed 7.5, which, by the way, is close to impossible. Yeah, so it's, it's not happening. And I think the government, uh, Mr. Modi is, in the end, quite realistic. I suspect he kind of kind of read, reads the tea leaves better than maybe Mr. Rajiv Kumar. I don't know. I, I feel like there is, there is some, his, his success is not because he's, he's impervious to such things. I now, think. We're what? talking about employment and jobs. We're talking about the need to make allowance for hire and fire so that people are encouraged to take on. Your book also makes another very interesting point. You say the entire labor market can be thrown into a tailspin by the fact that quite often government jobs are more valuable than private sector jobs. And one reason to prove this is that last year when the railways advertised some 90,000 jobs, 28 million people applied. And your answer and solution is simple. Make government jobs less desirable. But how? How do you do that? Oh, I, I, we have a quite specific suggestion, which is we should uh, have an, an, an internship process or a kind of, uh, uh, you, to take, get a government job, you first have to take a job at, you know, at kind of market wages for five years. And then if you do well at that job, you, you then qualify to be promoted into the kind of the secure government co core. And if not, you, you leave. And I think that's going to mean that, and make it sort of mandatory so that nobody sits at home waiting for the that government job. Say that, you know, you can take your exam, but your exam only quali qualifies you for a probation period. For a probation period. Well, once you've taken that probation period and you've done well, so then, then give, that gives people an incentive to perform very well. And it gives them, uh, um, it takes them out of sitting at home taking tests or after tests after tests. They just take, if they get, get an opportunity, and then the government can expand a lot also. also a necessary probation period before you get full security actually means that the job that you're seeking may not be quite as desirable because of the uncertainty you have to go through. Correct. So you may actually take a private sector job instead uh, because after all, you know, it's the risk of enterprise becomes more rewarding if you realize that the security of a fixed tenure is not going to be that easily available. Correct. So I think that that's, that, that that's our specific suggestion. Now, your book also has a section on Enrega, and Enrega, as you know, was intended as a safety net for those who don't have jobs. You point out that often in situations of drought, when Enrega is arguably most needed, it actually fails to perform effectively. Can you briefly, for the sake of the audience, explain what leads you to this conclusion? Well, we just look at the correlation between uh, Enrega payments and agricultural GDP. And those seem very weakly correlated. You would think that if agricultural GDP goes down by one rupee, NREGA payment should go up by one rupee. That's full insurance. In a sense, we, we see maybe it goes, goes up by few paisa. So it's, it's not, it just doesn't do a huge job of insurance. It actually goes up negligibly. Let me not put it very strongly because the data we've looked at carefully is just come from one state, but it doesn't, in that state, which I won't name right now. You name it in your book. I think you're talking about Bihar, aren't you? No. Bihar is certainly named in your book. But it's, this particular result is not from Bihar. There is something else, another study I mentioned from Bihar, but this one I don't, I don't name. Um, but this one study from this one state does suggest that the response of Enriga at a time of drought is small and marginal. It's not anywhere near sufficient yeah, or effective. So the, 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 the Martin Revalian et al. study from Rinku Murgai, Martin Revalian, someone else study from Bihar also finds that there is huge, when the demand for jobs is high, the response is weak. Now, in fact, Bihar is quoted as an example in your book, and I want to take that because through Bihar, you give the idea that actually even generally speaking, not just during times of drought, but generally speaking, Enrega is not functioning effectively. You write, like Bihar, India's poorest state, less than half of those who want work through Enrega get it. And you add, even when people get work, it often takes months to get paid. So clearly, generally, Enrega is not performing as effectively as we would want or as we need, which is why rural distress continues. Yeah, so it's not an... It's a, it's a, Partly, it's an interesting question. 
it's, it was designed to be an on-demand mechanism. Whenever you, you are in distress, you want it. But in fact, the way it was organized, and this was from the beginning, the concept of it was that it has to be mediated by the village government. The village government has to make a proposal of what they're going to use the money for, then the money has to be approved, then the money has to come, and then you get paid. So this means that if drought is going to, unless you, are, you can anticipate a drought, it's hard to coordinate those things. The reason so you're always behind the need? You're, you're a bit behind the need because you have to make this proposal, the proposal has to approve this whole approval process which made it, of course, more local, gave it local, more local political control, also creates this problem that you know, there, there, is a, there is slow response. So the approval process needs to be changed so that when there is need, there is immediate provision of work and this lag, which can be very detrimental often to the very survival of people, is done away with. Correct. Somehow we need to figure that out to, and that's, that's a challenge. Very quickly, Professor Banerjee, before we end this interview, I want to come to another section of your book which I personally found fascinating. And it's actually not to do with economics. It's to do with your analysis of the adverse impact of social media on democracy. You point out that because social media permits politicians and political parties to appeal to different people, different groups in different ways, it increases polarization. Explain very quickly why you come to that conclusion? Oh, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's other people's research that shows that, but it's, the logic is very simple. Logic is that we can segment. We don't have to, I can say, you know, uh, I can be for growth to you and for, um, you know, nationalism to you, someone else and for, you know, particular religious group for a third person and for a particular caste to a fourth person. I mean, I can design my message to people. I, I, this is why social media is so attractive to people is because I can target my message to exactly, I know your characteristics from all the things you do. I know what you like, what you don't like. I'm going to feed you the message you like. And because I can feed the message you like to each person who wants it, I can also divide them and polarize them. Correct. And that often benefits me as a politician because their polarization ensures both see me as their savior. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, you make another point about social media. You point out that in addition to creating polarization, it does three other things. A, it facilitates the spread of false news. B, it allows for this to be endlessly repeated. And thirdly, you say the crabbed language of internet communication, which Twitter takes to an extreme, contributes to the erosion of norms of civic discourse. So social media, in addition to polarizing, is also misleading, if not misinforming and wrongly informing people. And it's also simultaneously increasing intolerance and nastiness. Yeah, because it's, it's very, you know, I think you, it's, when once you give up the sense that, you know, at least your text should be written in a particular language, which in a sense was the norm of general, generalese, I think I think it's very easy to you get into this matter uh, of you know of you know putting uh, expletives into your Twitter. Uh, and it's, Twitter is you know rife with so abbreviated short form language can often become a disguise for the fact that you're also resorting to expletives, yeah, yeah. and this is very dangerous. In fact, you go one step further in your book. You say algorithms actually permit people to receive only what they like and what they want to hear yeah, yeah. and to exclude what they disagree with and what they dislike. And as a result, people end up living in echo chambers, which exist as separate independent silos with no communication. Correct. That's, uh, that's from, for example, I only get, these days I only get feeds about me. <laughs> it's, a, it's really uh, embarrassing, but my, half my Google feeds are come, are, have my name in it. That's a, and with your book and your analysis in mind, you wish it were otherwise. <laughs> I, I wish it otherwise, absolutely. In fact, you say this has a very damaging impact on democracy. In your book, you write, as we lose the ability to listen to each other, democracy becomes less meaningful. And there's a section of your book where you believe that this is a significant part of the explanation why violence against Muslims and Dalits in India is increasing at the moment. Yes, I think that it's just, I feel that it's very easy to make up stories and plant them and you know and you don't have to be you can be very powerful influencer if you coming out of you know uh, you you have an extreme view you can manipulate it and it doesn't have to be that this is 
you know, orchestrated by some party or the other. It just, I can, I get. It takes on a life of its own. Yes, it takes on its life of its own. The, if you have, the more extreme view you have, the, the, in a sense, you, the more ruthless you play this game. And this also means, doesn't it, that in a multi-ethnic country like India, where the fault lines can be fragile and easily breached, social media can be a double-edged sword. It can help, but it can also fracture and divide. Yeah, I think that's right. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, we're in very frightening times. I, 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 I'm a little bit uh, reluctant to pronounce too much on social media because somebody might point out I have no direct knowledge of it. I'm not on any form of social media. I avoid it like poison. But one of the most interesting parts of this book is in fact this analysis of social media because, and this is my last question, it leads me to ask you this. Clearly, social media is here to stay. Yeah. WhatsApp, Twitter, Facebook are parts of our life. Yeah. So since we can't do away with them, we can't wish them away, how do we curb or control their propensity to spread false news and their capacity to create prejudice. How do we curb that? The, the honest answer is I don't know. I've thought about it quite a bit. I, I think I, I tend to support people's right to say, say whatever they want to say, even things I don't particularly like. And, uh, Even members of the BGP suggesting you only got the Nobel because you have a second wife. I surely would not be uh, uh, in favor of banning people saying that. I, uh, you know, I think where it gets to the point of actually organizing violence, I think that's a point where we could stop it. And I think we have law the laws to stop it. It just doesn't seem to me to be... Right now, the laws need to recognize the velocity at which this happens and to step in quick, more quickly. The laws actually, the, we have laws which actually say that if, I, if you say that, look, let's go burn somebody's house, that's actually illegal to, to say and organize. But I think that's the kind of thing that we have no mechanism. So we need an instead of institutions which then respond to these things in a neutral way. And, institutions know. that counter false news and institutions that correct impressions that otherwise would create prejudice. Well, both of those, but I was saying something else. I was saying institutions that just enforce the law, that when you say something truly vile, which you will, you know, uh, sort of gets us close, close to, you know, violence against an, in, uh, against an individual, at that point, I think the laws should be able to con control that. And this puts the onus squarely on the government yes. because the police are under their control. And the police are under-trained, under-funded, under, uh, even the, the, the legal backing isn't fully cleared. So the government has to act if this has to be effective. So to sum up, what you're saying as regards social media is that we can't ban saying what they want. Everyone has a right to express themselves. But the second they transgress the law, we must come down immediately and it must be seen that they are being punished for transgressing the law. Correct. If you fail to do that, then you'll have no curb on social media whatsoever. Correct. That's absolutely true. Professor Banerjee, a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.